But in, in John's Gospel, it says, in the beginning was the Word. It's that same opening sentence. In verse 1 and 1 of Genesis, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 1 and 1 of, um, or one, well, yeah, 1 and 1 of John, it says, all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verses 3 to 4 says, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And John mirrors that when it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Can you see the parallels in these, in these two uh, pieces of work? In, um, in, in John chapter 3, verse 8, uh, the writer of Gen uh, Genesis, sorry, 3 verse 8, the writer says, And he heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In other words, God walked where Adam and Eve lived and, and where Adam and Eve was. And then in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This idea again of God not just um, being above us, but God living among us and being among us. Parallels. Um, in, in Genesis, we are told that God is a gardener. God creates this um, garden called Eden. And he places Adam and Eve in the garden. And God tends to this garden. And he gives Adam and Eve the instruction to tend, tend to this. And in John, again, we find Jesus where? In the garden. We find him in the garden um, when, when he's betrayed. But also when, uh, after he's been crucified. We find this whole scene takes place in a garden. And it's almost like John is deliberately picking things out of, um, of Genesis and rewriting them to give us this idea of new creation. In fact, when Jesus is risen, they mistake him for what? A gardener. In Genesis chapter um, 2, verse 1, God finishes his work. He finishes his work. On, 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 on the, uh, on the uh, sixth day and he rests on the seventh day and John tells us in chapter 19 verse 28 when Jesus is on the cross those words it is finished parallels parallels between the texts um, and, and so what John is what John is doing John is giving us this idea of new creation everyone say new creation mm -hmm. Um, when we read the text in, in chapter 19, you're, you, you may remember, I asked you to say, uh, or to, um, to speak, when it said it was the first day of the Lord. John's that's John chapter 19. But, uh, that's John chapter 20, rather, uh, in verse 1. But also in 19, John says, the, uh, the writer talks about the first day of the week. And whenever a gospel writer repeats something twice, guess what he wants you to do? Pay attention to it. He wants you to notice it. And so this idea of the first day of the week is, is important. Uh, and, and, and he's drawing your attention to it. And, and, and when you compare that back to Genesis, Genesis, God uh, completes his creation in six days. And then on the seventh day, he rests. And in, jo uh, in John now, we're on the eighth day. This is the eighth day of a new creation, a new being, a new, something new. God is doing something new. You know, one of the last par uh, parallels you see in, in the book of um, Genesis and then in John is this idea of God's breath, this idea of God's breathing. In Genesis, we are told that God hovers over the face of the deep. The Spirit of the Lord, rather, hovers over the face of the deep. We're told that God breathes into Adam the breath of love. And then, in the scripture we just read, God breathes on him and says, Receive you, the Holy Spirit. Parallels, parallels. And what we see in Genesis, creation is broken. But guess what God is telling us in, in John, or the writer of, of John is telling us? He's telling us that in Jesus, all things are broken. There is a new creation. Creation is renewed. And what John gives us is at the core of this, at the centre of this, is this idea of the kingdom of God. Everyone say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. John doesn't use the words kingdom of God. God. John uses the words everlasting life or eternal life. Those are the words that, that, that John uses. 
And, 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 and John, what John wants us to understand is this idea of what this whole resurrection means now. What this whole idea of what we're called to do means now. Eternal life. Everyone say that. Eternal, eternal life. life. Now normally when I say eternal life, we all think about it's what happens after we die. Mm. You know, once we've gone, you know, don't be sad, we'll see each other again, it'll be alright, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. And, and, and that's all good, I believe in that. But, but that's not what John's focus or emphasis is on. When, when, when John talks about eternal life, he's not talking about pie in the sky after you die. But he's talking about the power of living. He's talking about the power of life. He's talking about eternal life in the here and now. He, he, the idea of eternal life is this idea of life after life. It's life that doesn't stop, but it's life that keeps on coming and keeps on giving. It, it, it's, it, it, in John, he, he has his, uh, one of the other phrases he uses, he talks about abundant life or abundant um, living. And the Greek word here literally means beginning without ending. Or, or sorry, life without beginning or ending. It's life that's not restricted by a start date and an end date. It's life that's not restrained to the dash in the middle of two dates. You know when you go and visit a, a graveyard? And, and you, all that we know about the people that are buried in that graveyard is the day that they were born and the day that they were die, uh, that they died. And, and, and the, everything they've done is, is, is um, caught up in the idea of a dash in the middle of it. And, and I think what John is trying to get us to understand is that life is not restricted by that dash. It, life is not restricted to dates. It, it, when, when John talks about eternal life, it's something that outlasts dates. It, it, it has no beginning. It has no end. It goes beyond itself. It's a timeless life. It's a life of ages. It's life after life. Eternal life is about the quality of of your spiritual well-being, your physical well-being, all that you are. Eternal life is, is the quality of your zoe. It, it's how life is for you in the here and now. You know, I feel sorry for those people that are, so, that are so excited about the life to come. You know, you've met those Christians. I don't want to be here. I'm ready to go home. You know, and all that. And, and, and I feel sorry for people that are so focused about the life to come because you're missing out on the life that you should be having right here, right now. And that's what John is focusing on. This idea of a new creation. In, in John, we understand um, that the Great Commission and the good news of the kingdom is centered in the life of Jesus. In John, John, and we're going to see this as we look into the text, but one of the things John focuses on is this idea that, that, that um, the good news of the kingdom and the, and the Great Commission is somehow Christ-shaped. Everyone say Christ-shaped mission. Christ it's a Christ-shaped mission. It means that the Great Commission, it means that the good news, it means that this idea of eternal life, it looks like Jesus. That's, that's the idea of it. Um, and, and, and the Great Commission is all about how we live out that, like, uh, that Christ-shaped mission in our everyday living. How we live it out every day in practical, everyone say practical, practical, practical ways. Tell somebody you've got to live Christ-shaped. Christ your mission, your ministry, the things that you do, it ought to be Christ-shaped. It ought to somehow resemble what Jesus has done. And isn't it a shame that so often we hear about churches and we hear about um, preachers and, and popular Christians and, 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 and so often what they do is not Christ shaped. It resembles nothing like Christ. But yet we're called to live out a Christ shaped mission. In our, in our narrative this morning, we're at the first day of the week, that new beginning. And, and Jesus appears to his disciples. And I love, the, I love the text here. Because basically it tells you Jesus just walks through doors. Yeah. That's what it's telling you. It's telling you the doors were locked. Yeah. And Jesus just walks through. And all of a sudden appears in the midst of this people. And, and the first thing that John focuses on is that Jesus goes up to his disciples and he shows them his hands. He shows them 
his hands where he would have had the nails hammered into his hands. He shows them his, his, his side. And, and this is really significant to the text. Luke tells us, Luke tells us he shows them his feet also. Okay? Uh, and, and this is really significant to the text. Okay? I'll, I'll get to that. And the Bible says that the disciples saw it. Everyone say the disciples. disciples. So all of them saw it. Peter, John, you know, Luke, all of the disciples, Matthew, Matthew all these disciples, they all saw it. Um, except Thomas. Thomas isn't there for some reason. And, and, and Thomas hears about it. He hear, they say, we've seen the Lord. Okay, he hears about it. And, and Thomas is like, well, hold up a minute. I didn't see that. I want to see it. And he makes this statement, unless I see it, I will not believe. Now, poor Thomas has been labelled now throughout all the history as Doubting Thomas. <laughs> you know, when you read about Thomas, apparently, I think it's, um, we owe the gospel being spread to places like India because of Thomas, yeah. right? None of us remember that. <laughs> all, of the, all we ever remember is Doubting Thomas. You know, you think about the three disciples in the Bible, don't Get a bit of a hard rap. There's Judas, right? <laughs> no, you know, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you can do with it. You know, now, there's Peter. Now, Peter's chopping up ears, cussing and fussing, denying Jesus. You know, even after the resurrection, Paul has to pull Peter up because Peter is behaving in a very prejudicial and racist way towards the Gentiles, right? But Peter's all right, isn't he? Because Peter had that, thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And he has all of that, and Peter's all right. Thomas now. <laughs> Tell somebody, you leave Thomas alone. <laughs> Poor Thomas. I think the church has done Thomas a great injustice. I really do. And I think what we've done to Thomas is quite damaging in terms of what we do, in terms of how we understand our faith. Um, because bear in mind, everybody else saw it, but Thomas. Now, if you saw something, I don't want to hear your hearsay. So you don't want the problem with hearsay, don't you? You tell me what you saw, and then what you think it means. And, and that's how rumours start. By the time it's got to this side of the room, like, it's totally different to what it actually was. Because we've all added a little something to it. And, and I think Thomas is, N.T. Uh, Wright calls him every man. Okay? And I think Thomas represents the rational man. Thomas is the one that, I don't want to be duped. I don't want to be fooled. I don't want to be um, caught up into believing that, 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 you know, something that's not real. I want to see it for myself. Thomas misses out. And, 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 and I don't, you know, if I was there, and, and all of you lot would see me, I'd be like, no, man, I want to see it. <laughs> I, I want to see this miracle. I want to see it for myself. And, 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 and so I don't blame Thomas. But what we've done with Thomas, we, 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 we've blamed Thomas, we've called Thomas doubting Thomas. And what we've actually done, we've said something very damaging about faith, and we've said something very um, damaging about, um, about the doubts as well. Uh, N.T. Wright says this, he says, Thomas is every man. We live in a world of Thomases, of people who don't want to be taken in, people who've been hurt before and resist what they see as cheap and easy consolation. And this is who Thomas is. Thomas, Thomas is everywhere. Thomas wants to see it for himself. And one of the tragedies is we, that we told people, because of how we've interpreted Thomas, we told people there's no room for doubt in the church. There's no room for doubt in your faith. We've told people that doubt is the enemy of faith. That's what we 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 told people, you know. We call people doubters. But guess what? We all doubt sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Oh yeah, we all do. And and you know, I love those people, I don't doubt God. You're either lying or you haven't really experienced something real tragic. Because I doubt God more often than I care to admit sometimes. You know how often I doubt my word. Do you know how often I look in the mirror, despite what God has told me, despite what I'm told about how God loves me, and I still doubt. I doubt God's love for me sometimes. There are times when I'm at low points where I look in the mirror and go, how could God love someone like me? I doubt what I've been told. I, I doubt that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was enough to save someone like me. I, I doubt. All kinds of things. I doubt my worth. I doubt my values. I doubt sometimes that I can be really, I can be good and that I can reflect the goodness.
goodness of God. I doubt all of those things. And so when we look at Thomas, Thomas's account lets me know that doubt's all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thomas's lets me know that there is room for doubt in God's kingdom. There is room for doubt in your faith. And you know this, when you get to the back of it, because this is it's how we read the text, we get to the back of it, uh, uh, end of it, and we see where God says, don't doubt, but believe. And we see that as a review. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it as a review. I see it as an encouragement. I see it as, as, as God saying, you've seen that. Now go on and believe. And then afterwards he says, blessed will be those that haven't seen it yeah. and believe. Mm -hmm. But he's not, he's not rebuking Thomas, but he's encouraging Thomas now to live out the best version of him, to do all the things that he's called to do. Mm -hmm. And I want to let you know today, there is room for doubt in God's kingdom. Yeah. You all sit here today, and, and, and we don't like voicing doubt. But I'm here to let you know today that the, the church is a safe space. Tell somebody it's a safe space. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you see what happened in that text? Thomas said, unless I see it, I won't believe it. And a week later, Jesus comes back with the uh, sole intention of showing Thomas and allowing Thomas to believe. And that's what God does with us. That's what God ought to do in our community, is, is create that environment where we can express our doubts. And in spite of all that, find faith, find hope, find those things that we are, we are looking for. And so I apologise for my little outburst there. But I couldn't, I couldn't just gloss past what they've done to poor Thomas um, and talk about it. But now I'm going to look back at the rest of the text. And I want to, I want to, the first thing I want to talk about is the significance of the hands and the side. Everyone say the hands, the hands. and the side. And, 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 and what the first thing that Jesus does when he sees his disciples, according to John, is show them his hands. And show them his side. What's so important about the hands and the sides of Jesus that this is the first thing that Jesus does? Well, one of the things I want to remind you about, one of the things that you may remember, you know when Jesus was resurrected, and I think this is in pretty much most of the gospel accounts. When they saw Jesus, guess what? They never recognised him. In John, they thought he was a gardener. Yeah. On another, he was on the road to Emmanus, Emmanus and they just thought he was a stranger. Yeah. Um, people didn't recognise Jesus. In, in, in John, it was Mary Madeline. Mary that spent so much time with Jesus over the last three and a half years that she sees him and can't recognise it. Imagine that. Imagine. Look at the people around you. Imagine being being seen, one of your brothers and sisters here, in the street, and not recognising it. I'm not talking about someone you don't see often. Mm. I'm talking about someone you see all the time, that you've seen literally every day in the last three, three years, and you don't recognise it. They didn't recognise Jesus. And, and, and John wants us to pay attention, I believe, to the, 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 the marks in his hands and his side. It's because this is the only way that they can identify Jesus. And I think this is interesting. When they, talk, when they identify Jesus, they don't identify Jesus by his resurrected body. They identify Jesus by the wounds in his hands and in his side. They recognize him by the scars that he bears. Yeah. And John wants us to know this and understand this. And I think this is, there's, there's a whole range of implications here and a whole range of application here. The first thing, we, the, we can't understand the resurrection unless we understand and feel and experience the crucifixion. Yes. The resurrection makes no sense in and of itself. It only makes sense in light of the crucifixion. Um, it, 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 tells us, uh, it tells us another thing, I think. I think it tells us something about the kingdom of God. And I think it tells us something about who we are as people and how we are as people. Because we, took, we spoke about it earlier. We spoke about perfection earlier, didn't we? We spoke about being perfect. And, and how many of us like people to see our wounds? How many of us like people to see our flaws? How many of us like to, to, to be exposed and vulnerable to the things that, 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 are, that, are, that were painful to us? 
And I think what, what um, John is, is telling us is, is that when, when, we, when it comes to Christ-shaped mission, Christ-shaped mission isn't um, identified by resurrection power only, but it's identified by the wounds and the scars that we all bear. And I think it tells us something about how we ought to be, that when we show people our scars, when we show people our wounds, when we show people what we've been through and how we've been through it and the pain that we've experienced, we testify that there is healing and wholeness after that. Yeah. We testify that that pain, that experience, that wound, that thing that broke you down and nearly killed you, it doesn't have the last word in your mind. It, it, it doesn't have to, it's not the full stop in everything you are. But after that, there's something else and there's something beautiful and wonderful that can come out of that. It, it let it, when, we, when we show our wounds and our scars to people, it's a testimony of the healing power that God does in and through us. And, and I love it. Jesus was known by his scars. Jesus was identified by his, by his scars. And there's something in that text that lets me know that we ought to be identified by our scars. Tell somebody, don't hide them. Don't hide them. Don't, don't hide them. In fact, here's the marks. Here's the marks. You know when you say to someone, here's the marks, you know what you're doing? You're inviting them in to experience that healing power of God. You're in, inviting them in. To, to experience the wholeness of all that God offers. You're, you're saying, come and see what he did to me and maybe he'll do that for you. It's an invitation. Don't hide it. Um, uh, an author, um, or a theologian rather, a theologian by the name of William P. Brown, and, and actually this is taken from something he's writing about the environment and creation, but, but it, it's... It, so, it really resonates with what we're talking about today. He says, the resurrected Jesus is recognized not by his words, but by his wounds. The wounds of his crucifixion. And herein lies a great irony. The crucifixion has left its indelible marks upon the resurrected one. Such that the risen Jesus is recognized only, everyone say only, only, only through them. The marks of mortality, specifically the brutal marks of execution, turn out to be the definitive signs of Jesus' resurrection. On one hand, resurrection has not erased his wounds. On the other hand, Jesus' wounds no longer define him as a dead criminal, uh, as determined by the state. Jesus doesn't wince at Thomas's touch. Even as his wound, uh, wound, wounds remain, Jesus' body is made whole and new. Jesus' scars become these strange symbols of hope and glory. That's what William is telling us. There are symbols that signify strength, not weakness. You know, you know when, when you see someone that's lost an arm, we, we associate that. We call it a disability, don't we? Yeah. We say they're disabled in some way. When someone has lost a leg, we, we say that there's something missing and now there's something that they're not able to do. That's what we're, what we're saying. But, but, but I think what John lets us know is, is that wounds are not, they're not marks to determine weakness. They're not marks to show, uh, to determine disability. But they're marks that ought to give us hope. They're marks that ought to signify strength. They're marks that ought to signify power. Uh, it, 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 it's this idea, come and see the marks. What it, you know, we, when we talk about vulnerabilities, we don't like being vulnerable before people. No. But guess what? I don't trust anyone that can't be vulnerable. I can't trust no one. If you ever want to enter into a real relationship, this is why the relationships that we had with each other, the friendships that we had, the, the, the lifetime relationships that we had with our partners, this is why they become so powerful. Because what we do, we're allowed to be vulnerable in those relationships. And we're allowed to show our vulnerabilities. And, 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 and what vulnerabilities let, let, let me know is that I can be vulnerable and I don't have to be perfect to be loved. I don't have to be perfect to be I I accepted. And, and what, when we talk about vulnerabilities in terms of God, it, what our wounds let us know, when, we sh when we're willing to show people our wounds, our scars, what they let other people know is that you can have a seat at this table. Yes. You can be invited to the banquet. God has got time for you because guess what? He's got time for me in spite of this. 
What, 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 the, what our scars and our vulnerability do is they shatter the illusion of our sufficiency and they point to his grace, to his mercy, and to his um, sufficiency. I love what um, with, uh, William P. Brown, uh, he says it in the latter part of the text, he says, the marks of mortality, specifically the brutal marks of execution, turn out to be de de definitive signs of Jesus' resurrection. On the one hand, the resurrection has, can, has not erased his wounds. And on the other hand, his wounds no longer define him as a, dead, uh, as a dead criminal, as determined by the state. I love that. I love that idea. He's got a resurrected body, but his wounds are not gone. You know, we, we like Superman, don't we? Mm. We like Superman. The Superman gets shot, yeah. and the bullets bounce off. Yeah, yeah. We like those ones where they get shot and then they power up and the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing left. It, 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 it's just as you were born. We, we, we like those things. But, but that's not what Jesus shows us. Jesus shows us his scarred body, his wounded body. But he said, guess what? These are not the last words. Look at somebody, tell them my wounds are not the last words. My scars are not the last words. They're not the thing that define me now going forward. They might have defined me back then, but they won't define me going forward. I think that's the first thing that we see, or one of the things we see in the text. Um, the, the next thing that we, we, we see in the text is, um, the, the text says, uh, after, after showing... After showing them his hands and his sides, he says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now I want you to just picture this. The disciples would have been terrified here. Yeah. Mm. At this point, they don't know that Jesus is risen. They've got no idea. They're in a room, the door is shut and locked. Now somebody it's locked. <laughs> and they're there talking amongst themselves. And then they turn around, and there he is. And they don't recognize him until they see the wounds in his side. And, 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 and you've got to understand the state of mind that the, the disciples would have been in, in this point. Their future is in tatters. They've invested the last three and, uh, three and a half years of their life into this one man, and to his cause, into the thing that he's caused them to be. And now it's in ruins. The revolutionary leader is dead and buried. And so their, their expected end had not turned out how they wanted to. And when Jesus turns up, he says to them, peace be with you. Turn to someone and tell them, peace be with you. You know, this is good news. But he says, in spite of your current circumstances, peace be with you. In spite of what you feel right now, peace be with you. In the midst of your pain and your confusion, peace be with you. In spite of your vulnerability and the terror that you see all around you, peace be with you. What he's letting them know is that peace is available right now. Yeah. Tell somebody else, look them in the eye and say, peace be with you. Peace be with you. This is the good news of Jesus, that the, the, the peace of God. That, that, that is readily available right now, in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your disappointment and discouragement, that, that there is a peace that goes beyond all of your understanding, all of your comprehension. There is something that you can have right now yes, that doesn't make that better, but it makes it better right here. Yes. Peace be with you. And then, and then, and, 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 and what Jesus then says to him, he says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. And again, what we're beginning to understand here is this Christ-shaped mission. Everyone say, Christ-shaped Christ Christ -shaped mission. mission. And what Jesus is saying is, is, God sent me, now I'm sending you. I want you to be little Jesuses. I want you to go out there. I want you to reflect what you've seen me reflect. And, 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 and the practical, the practi of this is, or the practicalness of this is, is this, this idea that we're called to live out love, hope, faith in everyday little ways. It, the, the idea here is that, that sometimes when we say mission, everyone say mission. Mission is such a big word, isn't it? Yeah. 
It's such a grand word. It can be an intimidated, an intimidating word, can't it? This idea of mission, this big, grand mission. But I think what Jesus wants us to understand, and particularly what John wants us to understand, John wants us to understand mission, not in this big grandness, but in our everyday. Do you want to say everyday? Everyday. everyday. Do everyday things that you do. And so he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And so my question here is, what does the sentness of Jesus look like? What did it look like when, when the Father sent the Son? Well, here's a few things. I just want to sort of throw out there. The first thing is, is that we see is that Jesus was not sent as a philosopher or a debater. Mm. That's the first thing I want to say. Because so, so often we feel that we're here to convert people. And so we get into pointless arguments with people. We spend time debating with people. You know, they're, they're, I love debating. I really do. There's something inside of me that likes debating, you know. But every now and then, I'm just like, I can't be bothered with this. <laughs> There's just no point. I'd rather watch The Wire mm. or something else. So I'd rather spend my time doing something else than just arguing with you. When Jesus was said, his purpose was not to have religious and philosophical arguments trying to convert people to a new religion. That was not it. When Jesus was sent, he was not sent as a conqueror. So often when we go out there, we want to shut down everybody else's experience, shut down everybody else's idea. No, your, your experience is not valid. What you believe is not valid. We shut it all down and we, sh we shut this thing called truth in people's face. There you go. There's the truth. Add that and you'll be all right. Jesus was not sent as a conqueror. His purpose was not to fight power through might, domination or manipulation. But his, his purpose was to fight powerful love, to fight oppression through, uh, uh, through justice. When we look at what Jesus was said to do, listen, these, these are the things Jesus was said to do. Jesus was said to teach. Tell somebody teach. 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 And when we talk about teaching, I'm not talking about classrooms, yes. but I'm talking about those moments you have with people where you share, you experience, and you help, you teach, you pass on something you know. Or, or that's worked for you. Jesus was sent to heal. Tell somebody heal. Yeah. Heal. heal. And that's part of the sentence. So, as, as so the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends us. He sends us out there to heal. To be a healing presence in somebody else's life. And that's a challenge I'm leaving with you today. When you get to your office on Monday, or your supermarket on Monday, or your club on Monday, or your gym on Monday, or wherever you are on Monday, or whoever you meet on Monday, are you going to be a healing presence in that person's life? You know, Jesus was sent to set people free. Okay? Jesus was sent to challenge injustice and oppression. He was there to stand up to the ones that were being pushed down uh, or, or doing the pushing down and stand with those that were being pushed down. Jesus was sent to live among us. That is John's thing, isn't it? The Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Live. Live amongst your colleagues, your friends. Live. You know, so often you get um, Christians and they're so standoffish. I mean, unless if I'm doing this, I can't do anything. I can't be partake of your life because, you know, you're too sinful or whatever. No, 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 no. Jesus was sent to live amongst us. To live with us. To be healing and, 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 and set us free in the midst of all of that. Jesus was sent to suffer for truth and righteousness. Jesus was sent to rescue us. In fact, when you, when you want to look at the sentence of Jesus, Luke 4 perfectly um, um, phrases this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord was upon me, because he had anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He had sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the uh, acceptable year of the Lord. That's what the sentence of Jesus looks like. And that's what we're called to live out. So, so Jesus says that. And, and you get this idea. And I've got a quote here. I'm just going to put it up. It says, a church exists, in other words, for what we sometimes call mission, to announce to the world that Jesus is its Lord. This is the good news. And when it's announced, it transforms people and societies. Mission in its wildest, as well as its more focused sense, is what the church is there for. God intends to put the world to rights 
He has dramatically launched this project through Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus are called here and now in the power of the Spirit to be agents of putting to rights purpose. The word mission comes from the Latin word for sent. As the Father sent me, so Jesus after his resurrection, uh, said Jesus after his resurrection, so I am sending you. Put the world to rights. Put it to rights through love. Put it to rights through hope. Put it to rights through faith. Put it to rights through generosity. Put it to rights through kindness. Put it to rights by being a smile on your face to somebody who needs it. Put it to rights by being a hug around somebody. Around somebody. Put it to rights for being a slap on the back and standing by somebody that's got nobody else standing by it. Put it to rights through those everyday little ways. Put it to rights by putting your hand in your pocket and paying for something that somebody else can't afford, I can't afford to, but you can. Put it to rights through those everyday little ways. So the Father sent us, sent me, Lord Jesus said. So I Send you. And then, and I'm going to finish on this, but then he says, he breathed on them. Tell somebody he breathed on them. He breathed, he breathed on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, this is the power of heaven. Let me show you that. Everyone say power. 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 Say it powerfully. Say power. 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 <laughs> we are commissioned. We are on commission. And, and as this, we're a partner with God Himself. Everyone says co-mission. Co-mission. That's what it means. It means you're not alone. Yeah. You're, we're partnering with God. And so what, what Christ-shaped mission looks like is God giving us His Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit-empowered mission. We're not left on our own and to our own devices, but we have this help that helps us and guides us and directs us and enables us. The Holy Spirit is about power. <coughs> Power. Luke calls it power from on high. That's what Luke calls it. And 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 and, and you know, I think we misunderstand. You know when I said say it powerful, I got you to deliberately say it <laughs> because we miss out on what power really is. You know, I'm gonna power up. Here we go. Here we go. This is our understanding of power, isn't it? It's Hulk smash. It's what? And just for the record, that's not me up there. <laughs> It's Force Hammer. <laughs> it's Captain America's shields. It, it's Wonder Woman. It, it's Captain Marvel. It, it, you know, it, when, when we talk about powerful statements, we, we like the idea that I'm Daenerys Stormborn, the House Targaryen. First, the uh, first of her name, the under, queen of the Andals, the first of men, the Khaleesi of the Great Sea, breaker of chains, mother of dragons. <laughs> we love that, don't we? We love that. My name is Maximus Meridius. Yes. We love that stuff, don't we? When we talk about power, we love the bang, we love the explosions, we love, we love this idea of, of, of all of this, this idea of power. TV series like power, you know, powerful people with a lot of money doing powerful things. And we, we love the idea. And, and, but, but tell somebody, I think we miss it. I think we miss it. I think we miss it. We try, and, and this is the thing, we try and act powerful. You know, you get preachers, we act powerful. This is why we do, this is why people wear the miracles. Yeah. Because you know why we want miracles, don't we? To make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is why you see people, you know, like, oh, well, I've said, I love these videos. Someone with a tap, <laughs> where the crowd's falling out. You know, a preacher's like, boom, and then people try. Yeah. We love that stuff, we love it. We love it when God does heal people, and I believe God does heal people. And then, and then when we don't see it, we try and blame everybody else, because you're doubting, isn't you? You're a Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. It, it's, it's what we do. We, you know, preachers, we, we know how to preach, especially us from the Pentecostal background. We, we can craft our words and, you know, tailor our speech to sound as if power is powerful. You know, we do things like that. You know, I remember years ago when I used to preach, you know, I'd come out tense because I was doing it with this. <laughs> you know, because that's what power is to us. It's that kind of power. But we miss it. Yeah. Because he calls it 
He calls it dunamis, but he changes the world through an unassuming man called Jesus. A man that weren't pretty to look at. A man that weren't, people weren't naturally attracted to. Yeah. A man that died a wretched death on a wretched cross and was buried in a tomb he couldn't afford. That's how God changes the world. A man that at the end of him, nobody stood by him. Yes. Except the women. Yes. They all forsake, forsook him. They didn't even there. It was only the women that were there watching him being crucified. Yes. Nobody. They all forsook him. That's dunamis. Power. Mm -hmm. You know, when God chooses to change the world, when God says, I'm sending my Messiah, guess what he gives us? He gives us a vulnerable baby. We mentioned this a few weeks ago. He, he's the word in a wordless faith. That's what God calls dunamis power. God changes the world for a man that's on the run from a foreign and, and I love this idea. A man dying the most painful, humiliating, and shameful death. The death on the cross. This is power. This is power. You know, you know like real power, you can't see it. Because it happens on a subatomic level. It happens beyond what your eye can see. When you see the explosion, that ain't the real power. That's just the aftermath of what really happened. And, 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 and actually, when, 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 we, when we talk about power, so we're so often trying to look powerful that we, we, we miss it. Um, a quote, this is, this, is, this is the image of power that God chooses to give us. This is the image. I want you to resonate. The image of sacrifice is the image of power that God gives us. N.T. Bryan says this, the Spirit will call the world to account through us. I love that. The Spirit will call the world to account through us. Through our speaking, yes. But as much, uh, but just as much, read the Acts of the Apostles and you'll see how it works. Through our common life. Everyone say common life. Common life. Through our witnessing life. Everyone say witnessing life. Witnessing life. Through our own struggles for holiness and unity. Everyone say struggles. Struggles. Through our refusal to obey rulers when they tell us to disobey God. Coupled with our peacemaking, health-giving lives, which demonstrate that the gospel doesn't make us cross-grained and awkward for the sake of it, but rather community builders, joy bringers, culture makers, home makers, Wisdom brings. That's power. Mm -hmm. Tell somebody that's power. That's, that's power. power. That's power. And so when we talk about this idea, when Jesus breathes on us and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit, it's the power to love when what you see is our love. It's the power to forgive when forgiveness eludes you. And basically, I don't want to forgive. It's the power to hope when all that's around you is despair and hopelessness. It's the power to hold on when you feel like you're losing grip and your fingers are about to let go. It's the power to be healed and to heal. It's the power to make the difference in small and seemingly um, normal everyday ways. It's the power to vision what other people can't see in, them, in themselves. And sometimes what you can't see in yourself. That's power. Have you, have, you, have you had that lunch with somebody that you know is capable of doing so much more? And they just sat down there and told you that they can't do it. And God right there is calling you to exercise the power within you and to help them vision what they should be vision. That's power. The power to provoke and inspire, to make others see that they can be better versions of themselves. It's the power to help the least, the forgotten, the forsaken, and the outcasts. That's power. That's what Christ-shaped mission looks like. God bless you.